this video, I'm going to be making a paperback. Now you're thinking most people want to turn their paperbacks into hardcovers. I think many people underrate paperbacks. Maybe you've just written your first novel and you can't wait for the publisher to release the paperback, so you make your own. In this video, I'm going to bind a copy of The War of the Worlds and I hope you think it looks just like a machine-made paperback. This is not what most handbook binders aspire to, but the machines are the best binders of paperbacks and I'm aspiring to match the best. The model book I'm going to use is this copy of The Man in the Grey Flannel Suit. I chose this book because it's really important to me and this copy happens to be about A5 size and I didn't want to have to waste paper by trimming my A5 paper too much. And the cover has a technical feature that I want to use, and I'll point this out when we get to it. I'm going to get stuck into this binding, and I'll explain some technical and background stuff about paperbacks as we go along. To make a paperback style book, I'm going to do a simple double fan binding, and then put a card wrapper cover on it. Very simple. Most cheap paperbacks made by machines are made differently, but I'm not a machine, and I'll explain the difference in a bit. First thing, I need a text to bind. So I ask my friend Jason, who sells books in sheets ready for a sewn binding. He offered me the PDF of his latest book, The War of the Worlds. Sorry, I can't share the PDF, but please go check out Jason's website, Binders Editions, to see if there are any books there that you might like to bind. Then I loaded A5 long grain clear book paper into the printer and printed the book. One advantage of single sheet bindings is no imposition required. All the paper I sell is short grain, so I had to cut some of my A4 short grain paper in half. The generic name for this binding is an adhesive binding, and the specific version I'm doing is a double fan binding. Instead of a bookbinder's finishing press, which I normally use, I'm going to use a couple of covered bricks and a wood clamp, which works just as well. I add two blank leaves at the front and back of the book, and an outer waste sheet for protection, which will get ripped off later. With the loose sheets, if we just held the book in a press and applied glue to the spine, the leaves of the book would be held in by the tiny contact point along the very edge of the paper. This is done in the technique called padding when we want the pages to be easily pulled off the notebook or pad. What we want is for the adhesive to extend ever so slightly onto the faces of the leaves along the spine edge, just a bit. For the paperback, the way we do that is by fanning the pages, by bending them, then applying the glue. This is done in each direction to get a good adhesive coverage. The glue is then allowed to dry with the spine clamped along the spine edge. Because of the fanning of the book in each direction to apply the glue, this is usually called the double fan method. But to be geeky, it's often also called Lumbecking for Emil Lumbeck, a German bookbinder from the mid 20th century. This is not perfect binding, which is another form of adhesive binding, and I'll talk about that later. I knock the book up to the spine and head and get it square and clamp it between the bricks. Once I apply the adhesive, I'll put a couple of pieces of waste either side and a couple of pieces of wood and again use a couple of wood clamps to clamp the spine while the adhesive dries. Any PVA or EVA designed to work with paper, which can easily be bought at an office store, will work fine. I wouldn't use Elmer's school glue and I certainly wouldn't use super glue, epoxy or wood glue. Really, no wood glue. Once I've done that, I'll leave it to dry overnight. Soft cover books go back to the start of the codex form of the book 2000 years ago, and adhesive binding of single sheets dates well back into the 19th century. I'm focused on the modern version which uses modern synthetic adhesives. The modern paperback was made popular in the 1930s by publishers such as Alan Lane in the UK, who released the Penguin Book imprint, Albatross Books in Germany, and Pocket Books in the US. Paperbacks are bound by machines, and, and while the basic structure hasn't changed much, technology has, and there's a lot of variation in the details, especially the adhesives used. Now is a good time to look at how a paperback opens. 
The two main mechanisms in a book opening are the spine arching up, graphically called throwing up by bookbinders, which allows the pages or the leaves to start to separate, and the paper bending, which is called drape. The opening of this paperback is a combination of those two things. In this book, how easily the spine throws up is determined by the flexibility of the glue used, how thick the layer of glue is, how far along the edges of the pages the glue reaches from the fanning, and eventually the lamination of the cover to the spine. Paperbacks like this are all called tightbacks. The covering material is glued to the spine of the book. Most modern hardcover books are hollow backs. In a paperback, you need to make the spine stiff enough that it can throw up a bit, but not too much. The spine can throw up because of some flex in the text paper, the covering material and the glue. But if it goes too far, one of these will fail and the spine will crack. It might not tear, but it will have that familiar issue of an ugly crease on the spine and the book always opens at the same spot. And eventually it will fail at this point. How much the page is draped depends on a number of things such as the type of paper, its weight and the grain direction. Machine made paper has a grain direction and paper will drape much better perpendicular to the grain. One of the golden rules of bookbinding is that the grain direction goes head to tail. Most cheap paperbacks use a cheap, soft, light paper. Unfortunately, the printer will try and minimise the paper waste and will not pay much attention to the grain direction, and it's common to find paperbacks with the grain in the wrong direction. Once the glue on the spine is dried, I need to make the wrapper cover. I knock something together in Word, I print it on some semi-gloss art paper, and most importantly, the paper grain must go head to tail. I'm going to laminate the paper cover to some 300 GSM or 10 point cardstock. The grain direction of the card must also be head to tail. Before I laminate the two, I'm going to relax the card by wiping it with a moist rag. I don't want it wet, just slightly damp. Once it's had time to relax, I apply the PVA to the card and apply the paper cover to it. I'll wrap it in some paper towel and put it under some weight to let it start drying. After about an hour, I'll take it out and let it air dry. The art paper I've used for the cover has a coating on it. Most paperbacks have a coating on the outside. If you leave one on the bedside table and the humidity is higher than when the book was made, the inside of the cover absorbs moisture from the air and expands. The coating on the outside of the cover acts as a moisture barrier and it can't expand anyway. The result is the covers curl out. I hate this. By moistening the inside card, it's like binding when the humidity is 100%. And hopefully the worst case is that the cover will curl inwards slightly when left unshelved and will never curl out. I use a scrap piece of paper to work out how wide the cover needs to be and I cut the cover to size. Now remember our model machine made book? To help hold the cover on, it's not only glued on at the spine, but the glue extends onto the front and back about 7mm in this case. So I need to crease the cover at the shoulders of the spine and at 7 millimetres away from the shoulders. These creases go in opposite directions to each other, which you need to keep in mind. Modern paperbacks are mostly single sheets of paper bound together by applying glue to the spine. You might occasionally see paperbacks or soft cover books made with folded sections. These could be sewn, but they don't have to be. There is a machine that can perforate the back of the sections and that adhesive is applied with some pressure which forces it into the perforations, which is what stops the central folds of the sections from falling out. There are advantages to this technique, but it's not worth trying to replicate the machine's efforts. If you want folded sections, then do a traditional hand binding. The result will be much better than the machine's. The double fan binding is often confused with perfect binding. Perfect binding is a variation of adhesive binding. It's a machine binding method which applies adhesive to the spine without fanning the leaves. 
To get a better connection to the leaves, the spine is grooved, notched or otherwise roughened up to tease out paper fibre and create a larger surface area for the adhesive to bind to. Modern adhesives such as Hot Melt EVA or PER are used, which are not in the realm of hand book binding, though you can buy small machines to do this type of binding. Nearly all, maybe all, cheap mass-produced modern paperbacks are bound this way, not using a fanning method. Now it's time to cover the book. I apply glue to the cover from crease to crease and put adhesive on the spine for good measure. I bring them together and rub the spine carefully to not damage the spine. I should rub it down over a piece of paper to be safe. And then I put it under a brick and use the other brick to push a piece of rolled up paper towel into the spine to hopefully push it into the spine while it dries. If the spine is slightly concave like mine, it's because the clamps used to clamp the spine while drying were too strong. I don't know what I did wrong when folding the cover. The title was supposed to be centered and it was on both my practice covers. Sorry, but I wasn't gonna do it again. I'd already used $70 worth of paper on prototypes in this final book. Just put more thought into it than I did. If I'd been more careful cutting my A4 paper in half, I probably wouldn't have to trim the edges of the book. But mine's looking a bit rough around the edges, so I'll give it a quick trim with the guillotine. Hopefully you have a friendly print store near you that will trim your book too. This video has got longer than I expected, but there's one last thing I need to talk about so I don't get a heap of comments about it. It has been and is common to cut grooves in the spine and to embed cord to reinforce the spine. You can do it at an angle or straight across the spine. There is a version where you use thin thread and almost lace the spine by running the thread along the shoulders between the cuts. I did this on many books in the 90s. 
I no longer think it's such a great idea and almost never do it and I might only do it on a very thick book, say over an inch or 25 millimeters thick. The reason for doing it is that it makes the spine stiffer, reducing the chance of the spine splitting and it provides an extra form of connection between the leaves and a bit more surface area for the adhesive to grab which is all great unless the book needs rebinding, which they nearly always do eventually if the book gets used. Without the cords, you can usually clean off the leaves and just do another double fan binding. But with the cords, you nearly always have to trim the spine, which I'd rather avoid. I hope you found something useful in today's video. As always, I really appreciate you hitting the big thumbs up button. If you're able and want to, you can support the making of more videos like this through Patreon or with a one-off contribution and the details are in the description below. If you want to be notified of my future videos, please hit the subscribe button. Until next time, cheerio.